We are getting ready to go on a trip. It's We're going to Fairbanks, which is where my family lives. And this is, I think I said this is the fifth um, road trip we've been on since the babies have been born. We've become pretty good, I feel like, at road tripping. The babies are pretty good about road trips. So we're going to be sharing some tips and tricks on how to make a 500 plus mile road trip successful with two young infants. I think it's like 590 miles. So normally that would take us a little under 11 hours probably from here. Mm -hmm. um, obviously it's going to take us longer with babies. We need to stop and eat and stuff. But yeah, so far they are pretty good travelers and I think it helped, you know, we just started traveling with them right away. They went on their first couple hour road trip when they were like three weeks old, four weeks old. They're pretty little. So um, yeah, we've just had them on the road and sleeping in other places like ever since beginning so um i think that definitely has helped a lot it'll change you know as they get mm -hmm. older things change and so what works now might not always right. work but well, this is yeah, what's working for us right now work. <laughs> always work so first tip what we're going to talk about packing and what we pack and how i pack for a road trip with babies it's kind of my like baby medical stuff together I'm just a couple things but especially since they are sick a little bit um i always carry a thermometer fingernail clippers um diaper balm chest rub saline stuff i have my nose frida which is out there i'll grab that um i normally bring one of these just in case i have to pick up any sort of medicinal thing or if i'm bringing some stuff i'm bringing elderberry for them right now so yeah i just put this in a bag and this goes in there um in their bag too. Asher has eczema just like Silas and I. This one seems to be the best that we found that works for him. So I'm definitely putting this in. All right so this is um the bag we've been using for the babies and it's about the perfect size and it's just like a standard carry-on size bag. Um but I have been using Ziploc bags. You can divide them several different ways. I've done them like pants in one, Bria's onesies in one, Asher's onesies in one. This time um, since we have like a couple more like party type things, I have like a few more like outfits. So like I have like, there's two sets of matching outfits in here. And then I have onesie, extra onesies and extra pants. And then I just put sleepers in the, in the, um, they're just free in the bag. And then it's like super easy. Um, and then when I do laundry, it's super easy because I almost always am doing laundry when we're traveling to, um, I don't have to pack enough stuff and their babies they go through a lot of laundry so then it's super easy to just stuff it back in the right bag and then there's like great pockets so other things is like socks for them so in there these are really good for cold weather um they sail on a little better than socks sometimes um so i really like these so i take these almost all the time when we're traveling in state um bibs for Bria because she spits up all the time. They'll be wearing hats in the car, but I always pack extra, some extra winter hats and then some like lighter weight ones too. And then I got some hair bows for Bria and then her bibs. I try and keep the bag very similar every time we, since we do travel so much so that it's, I'm very familiar with it. Silas is very familiar with what's in it. Um, I use this front pack, this front pocket for burp rags stuff like that oh the other thing is their sleep sacks um some of them are in the wash but i'll normally pack at least four so that we have a change and give me enough time to do laundry if they get dirty but so those sleep sacks will stick in that little pocket right there if there's room i'll throw in some toys and stuff like that if not i'll put them somewhere else since we're not flying we're just driving this is their bag of diaper stuff so this has diapers, wipes. I normally bring a little blanket so I can just kind of set up a station wherever we're at. Um, that just makes it convenient. I like to still have like a diaper changing station, um, whether we're in an Airbnb or at my parents. We're gonna bring this this time. This is like a little travel um, high chair basically. It's like a folding, kind of looks like a camp chair. These are great. We use those, we, this is what we use for high chairs here. They haven't started eating food, but we'll put them in there into play. So I think what's most important when you're packing for babies is organization, having some sort of system. Um, whether it's Ziploc bags, I mean, I use packing cubes for myself. I would love to get them packing cubes at some point because that really helps. And so some sort of organization so that you know where stuff is and it's easy to grab and go. It also makes it much, for me, it makes it easier in the packing stage too because it's just like, 
I don't have to worry about folding as much. Like I can just like stuff all the pants in a bag and then it's like, okay, we're good with pants. I guess there's like two tips that go with packing. It's like um, pack like in an organized way and then also pack things that are gonna make your baby sleep as easy as possible while it is traveling while you are traveling. So trying to make the sleep environment as similar as possible to when you're at home. This is our sound machine. It is great. Um, it's like a portable one, but this is what we use at home. So I normally, I'll throw this in a bag in the morning, um, first thing. So I make sure and have this. Um, depending on where you're going, I make sure and have stuff to make their room black, whether that's our like canopy cover thing for their crib, their sleep sacks, stuff like that, all of that to make it as easy as possible for sleep. Um, Cause that you don't really want to be on a trip and then like your sleep fall apart. Cause then everyone's just kind of miserable and it is going to be not the same and you're not going to get as good a sleep as when you're at home, but trying to just make it as similar as possible. So I think that's really important. Just kind of thinking about the things that you use for sleep for your babies, the things that they're used to, to try and make that environment as similar as possible. The second tip is to leave really early. <laughs> We're gonna try and get up at four and leave like at 4.30. Normally the babies sleep until like eight. So that'll give us a good three, four hours of what time that they would normally be sleeping mm -hmm. anyway. So that gives and us- And time that we start. can just drive and not have to stop. Cause obviously when you're road tripping, the best time is when the babies are sleeping. Uh-huh. <laughs> Why are you awake, mister? All right, it's four o'clock in the morning and we're hitting the road. It was much earlier than we actually anticipated hitting the road. We were planning on getting up at four, so we'll see how yeah, it goes. We're gonna drive. <laughs> yeah. So we're 40 minutes in at our first gas stop, and so far it's working. Babies are back asleep. Um. <laughs> I'm sleepy too. Back asleep. One of the big benefits to driving this early in the morning too is we've only passed like three other vehicles in 40 minutes. So that speaks to the population density of Alaska. This is the only road there is and we've only passed three vehicles. They normally sleep like, we normally put them down for bed about 7.30, 8 o'clock. And they normally sleep until about 7.30, 8 o'clock. So that was kind of the hope of leaving at 4 is that we'd get about 4 hours. They're sick, so I'm kind of wondering if they maybe will sleep more today than they would normally. We'll see. I've kind of sleep trained from the beginning. It does not mean what people think it means. <laughs> I do a pretty good schedule, and then I just watch when they're sleepy and try and make sure we're doing appropriate wake windows for their ages and making sure they're getting enough daytime sleep, but not too much so that they sleep well. And yeah, just overall like we have a schedule but being flexible with that and like we've always napped on the go and stuff like that and so that makes it easier i think when we're traveling we're hoping to keep leaving early like as they get older and so if any of you have older kids even like i don't know six and eight years old and you know do stuff like this let us know if it works, if it works. <laughs> we feel like it should because we feel like yeah if you leave at four in the morning and then i mean you just get them up in the middle of the night, load them up, and maybe they can sleep for at least a good part of the drive in the morning. I don't know. It's our theory. Record pool so far. So the next tip is planning stops. Um, obviously you're gonna have to stop anyway, but kind of just work that into, into your plan and count on it. Pick a good spot where you know you can entertain the babies for a little bit um, and just give them a break from the car seats. And if that needs to be multiple stops, we're probably gonna just try and have one major stop, but mm -hmm. we'll stop a couple other times. Just to feed them. Mm -hmm. but we're gonna plan a major stop to give them a good 30, 40 minute break at least out of the car seats. Um, walk and around. That and should, the timing stuff. of that, hopefully, we're trying to do it. So since we're leaving at four in the morning, the timing of it, 
it's kind of like when they would normally be waking up so like having kind of more of a normal morning where they're kind of like awake and whatever for a while and before we and doing stuff and then before they get back in the car seat and probably take their first nap we went and got coffee and now we're walking around walmart so not super exciting but as they get older we'll probably make it more exciting they don't really interact with me right now so they like to just watch stuff so walmart's a good place to look at new things <laughs> even found some stuff to buy that tip like i think that goes for like older kids too like um you know you can talk to your toddler about like we're going to make this fun stop and we're going to do xyz then it's like something to look forward to on a long road trip instead of just you know stopping when you have a meltdown or whatever and it'll probably get more frequent you know mm -hmm. as they get older and attention spans get right shorter, <laughs> start planning two or three uh -huh. stops where we can get out and play for 20 30 minutes or whatever. yeah for a little bit. I think it's time to eat. Do you want to eat too, Asher? <gasps> Did you give smiles? So it's 31 below where we just stopped to feed the babies. So Getting one, back on the road now. One of the coldest places we've like been through, you know, and that's where we had to stop to feed them. But Sunrise at 11 14. <laughs> sometimes I ride in the back with them. Sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. So you kind of have to know what stage your babies are at. Like, I know friends who, like, they've ridden in the back with their babies like the whole time and it actually makes their babies have more meltdowns because they just want to get out and they want mom to hold them. So I don't ride in the back all the time, but I ride back there like when I'm like, I can sense they're just, they're getting bored, that sort of thing. And they do pretty good if I pop back there and like I just talk to them and I read books to them and stuff like that. So I will definitely be packing stuff that like they can't really play with on their own in their car seats. But when I do hop back there, I'm able to like read them books. I'm able to like shake their rattle for them. Um, they love this thing, <laughs> um, stuff like that. And so that that's worked pretty well for us is just if once we get to a point where we think like a meltdown might be imminent, um, hopping back there. And normally that really helps control it. So part of road tripping is also finding where the diaper changing places are. <laughs> we just stopped for our second gas stop off the trip. Cheese and Bonus tip is travel in sleepers because they're easier to change. You don't have to worry about socks, but it's still keeps them warm and just makes it easier, especially the ones that have the two way zippers, which Bria's does here. All right, we can go. Here we are at sunset at 2 o'clock, just three hours after sunrise. We got in Fairbanks around 4.30, uh -huh. so like 12 and a half hours, it could be a lot worse. Yeah, that's not honestly, it's like, if you Google map it, it's like 10 hours, but it's not honestly that much more than it used to take us when we were just doing it ourselves, you know, like, because we stopped too. <laughs> but kind of our last tip is just managing your expectations to plan on more stops. And the plan on there is going to be moments where they're fussy and where they're crying and it's kind of just part of having kids, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, traveling. things are things are different now. You can't just drive for 10 hours straight and never stop. That's just 
it's not fair to anybody. <laughs> and so even just, your wife. I used to have to tell Silas that too. Like we have to make stops just even for me, like before the babies came. Just kind of embracing that and making the best of it helps everybody. If you're stressed and trying to make a certain time or whatever, and you don't want to stop, nobody's going to be happy. Mm-hmm. And if you're, if you're stressed and not happy, then the babies are going to feel that and mm-hmm. be upset too. And I think as they get older, they'll feel it even more. So if you can just enjoy the trip for what it is, then it'll be more of an enjoyable time for everybody. There were moments where they cried and we had to stop. And when we weren't really planning to, we were like, okay, well, we're gonna try and make it to this destination. And then before we stop, and it was like, okay, we made it 45 minutes down the road and we had to stop. And so it's just like, okay, that's okay. And so just like being okay with that and rolling with it and yeah, not stressing about it. Yeah. And if you, yeah, if you can try and have a good time through it, then they're gonna have a much better time and it'll just be much more pleasant and feasible for everyone. So and they, that's kind of our goal yeah. is to be able to do it long term saying that they should enjoy it is maybe a stretch but not to dread it (laughs) as they get older so that's pretty much it let us know if you have any tips especially for older kids because we're not there yet (laughs) as we get into older kids what are your tips for older kids how do they differ we'll see you next time